Welcome to Best Practice, a show where we interview leaders in the building industry to unpack the tools, strategies, and tactics they use to run great organizations. Today, I'm so excited to be joined with George Valdez, my colleague, and Greg Pasquarelli, founding principal at Shop Architects. Greg Pasquarelli established and has been at the center of Shop, which is a collaborative and innovative practice in creating new models for design, master planning, and real estate development to define the context of cities and transform communities. Greg has led many of the most complex and dynamic projects like the Porter House, Barclays Center, and the second tallest tower in Manhattan, 111 West 57th Street. His firm, which I'm sure everyone here is familiar with, Shop Architects, has been awarded hundreds of design awards and was named most innovative architecture firm in the world by Fast Company and was the recipient of the Smithsonian Institute's National Design Award. The work is even in the permanent collection of the MoMA. So anyways, with that, thank you so much for joining us, Greg and George. Huge pleasure. So happy to be here today. Everything going on with COVID, it's, you know, we, we miss all this kind of interaction. So I'm super glad that you guys have made this kind of platform and format to, to, to have these conversations. It'll be fun. Absolutely. So I want to start the conversation off with this question that we've been asking in our 1000 interviews, which is what's your lens on practice? <clears throat> um, lens in the sense of uh, where do I think, how, like, how are we trying to focus on it or where do we think it's going? Both. Both would be great to hear. <laughs> well, I think that, um, I think that, you know, obviously, uh, you know, the world is, is, is in some pretty difficult moments right now. And so, you know, I think that we're, we're all thinking about uh, what's the healing that happens and what's the, what are the kind of changes that are going to come out of, the, out of the pandemic. And, you know, as New York architects, we sort of went through this kind of chaos with 9-11. We went through the kind of chaos in the global financial uh, crisis in 2008, 2009. And sort of this is, this is really the, the, the next big one. Um, you know, when, when, the, when the pandemic started in the first, you know, sort of six months, I was asked dozens of times by magazines and, and, and television shows, whatever, like, well, how is the office going to change? How are we going to read? How's design going to change? And I was like, putting up plastic dividers between people is really not going to do very much. And, um, you know, I think that, uh, I don't think that the physical environment is actually going to change a tremendous amount. I think that actually the biggest impacts are going to be in mechanical systems, in HVAC. Um, I think from an architectural perspective, we're really looking at uh, more indoor-outdoor space, um, you know, uh, a breathable facade, um, biophilia in the office. Um, you know, it's going to change from a full desking system. The way I've been talking about it is, you know, part half of your office is going to turn into a hotel lobby where it's really about who's coming and going and having meetings and more informal spaces and less about a kind of structured workplace. But, um, you know, the demise of the, the demise of the office, the demise of the office building, the demise of the cities, the demise of people wanting to go to the office and work and be together and share ideas and inspire each other is greatly exaggerated. And, um, and people I think are really um, excited in a lot of ways to, to get back. So that's, that's obviously been a big part of, of practice for the, for the last year plus. I'm very curious about like the trajectory of, of shop architects and how shop architects somewhat came into the scene as one of the you know um, emerging firms that was really dealing with digital fabrication and workflows, but that was also driven by a real, you, so almost like unique lens into practice. Also, in the sense that a lot of the founders had the founding team had uh, business experience mm -hmm. or or had studied uh, had had their MBA or, or whatnot. And so, um, what I'm very curious about is, Shop seems to be a very reflective company in the sense of always trying to understand like the business models of the industry. What do you think are the challenges currently in practice, like the areas of improvement that architectural practice um, can focus on um, and what's holding it back? Uh, wow, great question. So, I mean, when we started, it was, we, you know, 
the founders all had different, we, we all had other careers first. So whether it was uh, engineering or fine arts or marketing or banking or whatever it might be, um, you know, it, so that was interesting because we came into architecture a little bit later. And I think what it did was it allowed us to kind of freely adapt other methods of problem solving to architecture. Like we didn't feel like, oh, this is the only way that it could be done. We, we grabbed from, from lots of different professions to think about solving problems. You know, the business side of it, it wasn't that we were so interested in, in, in business per se or making money per se. It was really just understanding how are the decisions made in architecture, right? Um, because you know, the, I always like to say the difference between being an artist and an architect is in an artist, you buy your own materials and you do what you do with them, what you want. And as an architect, someone else pays for your materials. And so you have to negotiate with what you're, with what you do with them. And so that negotiation really becomes it. it I think that, um, architectural education in America today does a terrible disservice by not giving some basic uh, finance and business courses because a lot of those decisions are made because of financial decisions, right? It's, it's, and, and, and quite frankly, it's not that hard. It's like, you know, a, a business degree is like 60 vocabulary words and knowing Excel really well. Like, it's just not that hard. So like making it this big mysterious thing that we as architects who are like really smart people that can synthesize a lot of ideas and like lead it as this other thing that you don't engage with um, is a huge error by the profession um, because engaging in it really opens up the ability to design, right? And people think, oh, if I engage with that, it, 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 it causes, you know, it, it, it's a co in conflict with the purity of design. Uh, it, that's exactly wrong. <laughs> that's exactly the opposite. Engaging with it gives you greater freedom. Engaging with it opens up the possibility. Engaging with it actually helps you make better design by being smart about the way you're you're using materials, right? And it's not and using materials is is one financial, but it's also about sustainability. It's about it's about being smart with with how you spend the planet, not not just someone's checkbook. So so it's a it's really a kind of deeper, broader idea there. That said, um, you know, we were really at the forefront of digital technology um, because we were a young firm and like no one was going to give us, you know, Frank Geary budgets or Calatrava budgets or whatever. So we had to be scrappy and we had to be like, well, what's the advantage of a, that a firm of, you know, five people sitting in a loft above a Chinese restaurant? on the exit ramps of the Queens Midtown Tunnel, how are we gonna win a project against the 50 person firm or the 500 person firm or whatever? And we were like, well, you know, maybe we're, maybe we're younger and more nimble and smarter about technology. So if we like heavily invest in what's next, that might give us a little bit of advantage to sort of like claw our way up, if you will. And so, um, I think that was a really that was a that was a really important thing for us, and um, plus I think the last part was that another thing that that at the time that we were in school it was like you kind of had a choice like you could either be like a paper architect or a corporate architect like you could like do competitions and cool things and interesting and teach and theory and maybe you win a big competition and you start a practice or you like had to like learn everything about vent stacks and flashing details and master planning and, what, and like, and like they, they were separate. And we were like, why would you separate these things? Like, why can't you be a both and firm? And, and when we started reading the AIA contracts, when we we're out of school and getting our first projects and we saw that you weren't allowed to be involved in means and materials, I was like, what? <laughs> so what are we doing? Like decorating wallpaper, like to wrap the outside of a building? Like, shouldn't we know something about how the buildings go together? And so, so I think it was the confluence of those things, um, which were all breaking rules, you, you know, like known sort of ways of practice that, that really led to shop and the kind of work that we do today.
What ideas and mental models do you draw from from your pre-architecture career? I'd like to hear more about like yours in particular and then maybe some other mental models that came in from your other partners. Well, I mean, it was, you know, it's very, it's very simple. It's not super complicated. It was like, all right, if we want to do this project, like understanding a pro forma, right? Like a pro forma is how decisions are made, like whether the project is going to be built or not, like whether they can get funding, whether you know, and this isn't only for developer work, it's also for a museum. Like we're gonna go out and raise X amount of money and we're gonna have these kinds of shows and they're gonna be this number of people that come and the gift shop's gonna generate, like, can we make it happen? Is this a smart idea? Do we fly materials from all over the world and bring them together to make a space where people come together and are enlightened and happy or inspired? Like these are, but it's still a, it's a pro forma in a way. It doesn't only have to be a financial pro forma, but I think that, I think that having had a background in finance that I, I understood that very clearly. And it was like, it became a way of talking about it, not, not in a financial sense, but in a, what is this building going to do? Why are we doing this? Like, does it make sense? Does it make sense ethically? Does it make sense materiality wise? Does it make sense spatially does it make sense urbanistically and like so all of those questions um were constantly asked and then represented back to all the stakeholders and whether that's the owners or the contractors or the community or the city and and being able to construct a very strong narrative about your work i think is honestly one of the most important things you can do if you could tell a really good story, a very compelling story for a reason for why the building is there and what it's going to do and why it's worth the investment of time and energy uh, and materials and get people excited about it, that's the best chance of getting them built. I, I think with the performer, what's also kind of interesting about what you're, you're talking about, it's like your... Well, well, some of some in the firm already had that background of speaking that language, right? Of understanding those those tools as instruments, right? To to incentivize people. I think it's kind of like the other mental models that are layered with that is that idea of incentives. Like you're able to look at not necessarily my design, right? Because a lot of school is teaching you about like sort of authorship, right? And all those kind of concepts about you as the designer and all that versus like the kind of um, what you bring to the table is understanding that's actually various incentives that exist with different stakeholders. And what a pro forma, the mental model of a pro forma does is it kind of shows you the balancing out of all these different, right? What could be uh, diametrically opposed challenges, right? These other constraints. But by being able to map that over and say like, actually like this, the, the, at the local level, local level, the neighborhood, the community boards, they have certain incentives. And then at, at the developer has certain incentives. And what you're very good at is actually starting almost there first, in a sense, of like, what are the things that are kind of pulling apart from each other? And how do you use those as constraints for the building itself, more by like what it's going to do for, for all those different stakeholders, as opposed to like, starting with form, potentially, or starting with these other, you know, what what is more standard in education through academia today. Well, I think one is more connected to the real world and more connected to accomplishing something. I mean, like, look, I love sculpture. I love painting. I love art. I love beautiful buildings. And not everyone has to serve a purpose, but most of them do. And so why not just start there? Like, in, like, I mean, like, I, you know, when people complain about the parameters of, of a project, like, it's like, you're in the wrong profession. Like, the parameters are the thing that make it interesting. Right. Like, you know, I do laugh. I'm like, I'm like, I, I, don't, I don't know what we would do if we had like a grass field somewhere in an unlimited budget. I don't even know what we would design. Like, I don't know. So I'm actually not very interested in doing that. So, um, uh, but, uh, you know, like, so I, I, I think, you know, a little bit could, that, a little bit of that could come from growing up, you know, in New York City and where there's this battle over every inch, you know, it's like, it's like, it's like that cauldron of all those intense forces kind of makes you have to solve on so many levels. Um, 
But, you know, I mean, now like less than 10% of our work is in New York. It's actually really all over the country and all over the world. And those, those lessons are valuable everywhere. They're really valuable everywhere. And I think, I think when architects, instead of shying away from that, those battles, when they engage them, you get a bigger seat at the table, right? You're seen as a value add. You're seen as someone that's gonna help and do something inspiring and exciting. And so therefore I'm, I've, we have always been very open and receptive to being in those kinds of conversations. So um, you've talked before about like these limits, like it's not only like what's conventional, but also like what's advised against by uh, the standards of the profession. So like means and methods are going on the client side, like actually piercing through the scope that's supposed to be defined by the profession. Um, is that how we should rethink practice? What practice is? Uh, how far should we go? As you should blow the whole thing up as fast and hard as you can because it's broken. And every time we, every, almost every time, I mean, lots of times we failed. I mean, that's fine. Like, you know, but I'd rather fail at trying something new than, than do a mediocre job. at something that everyone else has done. And, um, you know, I think that, uh, the system's broken. So like wherever, like we try to take on every project. I mean, you, you, okay. The one thing I will say is like, especially as a young architect, like you, you can't, you can't try everything on one project. Like the, the, the way that we try to think of it is like a 90, 10 model, like, okay, 90% of it, like we know how to do, and this is how we love it, but let's say 10% of it to really research and explore and push and break stuff. And like, if you can do that on every project, you know, 10, 20 years later, you've actually kind of done something, right? Like it, ta it takes that long. So, um, you know, I think that, I think that there's so many things, there's so many areas that the profession, and when I say the profession, I, I mean more than just uh, architecture. I mean, you know, obviously AEC is a total, but, but just building and planning and city making and, and, uh, you know, habitation and, cultivation and like all of these things are, are, are like, you know, this making of our world that we live in is really what I'm talking about. And so supply chain issues, political issues, uh, you know, uh, equity issues, uh, uh, sustainability, all of these things. It's, a, it, it's so it's, it's not just architecture, but, um, but, you know, I think that, um, and I've said this before, many times, but it's like, it's like what I like about architecture is it's the last, it's kind of to me, like the last great generalist profession. Like, like the kind of cool thing is we kind of go in there and our skill set is that we're kind of good at a lot of stuff and we're good at synthesizing. Right. And when we try to be specialists, just as like creating aesthetics, I think we do the, I think we do the profession a disservice. And so, you know, as a young architect or a mid-career architect or late in your career, it's like that 10% where you can push it and you can synthesize it and you can get people behind it and you can move the, the, the ball forward a little bit. Like that's, that's to me, what's most interesting about what we do. I, I love this idea of blowing, blowing up the, <laughs> the way practice is done today. Um, and one of the things that's also been very interesting about shop is that it's it's done things maybe a little bit ahead of the curve on in the business model. And by that, I what I what I also mean is to say like, you know, shop has made investments in tech companies. Let's say right, like there's there's been investments in sort of having there's this idea of having skin in the game, which I feel has been like a a, a through line for shop in in some sense. It's like how do we start to like get into the asymmetric upside out of like changes that are happening as opposed to just doing, you know, only sticking to, hey, I'm going to deliver this project. And whether that was like, you know, um, uh, I don't know, I remember a story of like, you know, one of the projects that or, or, you know, the shop did where there was an equ actually equity position in the project, mm -hmm. things like that, but then also finding new ways to do that through investment in tech companies. Like, can you speak a little bit more about like where that mindset came from? Is that also part of like how you think about how you like if you think about the business as an asset too it's like how are you diversifying risk for the for the business itself yeah well i mean honestly a lot of the 
a lot of that stuff was like, unless you have skin in the game, like it's, it's hard to have, it's hard to have control over the decision-making process. If you're, if you're just a cost center, right? Like, but if you've got skin in the game, if you're, if you're an investor or you're a part of it, or you put the deal together and you're like, you, you have a bigger role to play. And it's when you get that bigger role that you can take bigger risks because like you're trusted by your partners to take bigger risks and try new things when you're a partner, when you're, when you have, when you're, when you have more at stake, because they know that if you make some bad decisions, it's going to hurt you at least as much as it hurts them. So like, you know, people would always say this to us, um, you know, they'd be like, oh my God, why would you be like, why would you invest in your own building or be, have an equity stake or put a deal together and do like, that's going to, that's going to hurt the architecture because, you know, it's a slippery slope to being in bed with the developer and, you know, you're making a deal with the devil. And, you know, I mean, like you couldn't believe the crap we heard. And we were like, really? Like I, it actually kind of scared me, you know, and I, I'll give credit to Bernard Schumi, who I went to talk to. And I was like, is this like, and he was like, get it, like, forget, don't worry about that stuff. And what I learned in the long run, and it's like one of the most important lessons I can share and we can all share is like, when we had skin in the game, we were able to do all kinds of stuff that no one would have, should have ever let us do, right? Like at the Porter House, we made the first, we made the first digitally fabricated facade the full facade with no drawings directly from the model, directly to laser cutters, to creating 4,000 unique shapes of zinc. And we had no facade contractor. We just built it ourselves, right? Like that was kind of insane, right? But, but, but we learned, it's amazing. it was like, and, and it was cause we just, cause, because we did it. And they were like, well, you're going to get, you're like, you'll be bankrupt if you screw it up. Like the, you know, our developer partner was like, I'll survive, but you'll be bankrupt. And we were like, yeah, that's right. So let us do it because we won't mess it up. And we didn't mess it up. And and that was how we pulled off that building. And, you know, remarkably, we finished that building in 2003. And it was only six years later that we got the Barclays Center. And we got the Barclays Center because they knew how complicated it was going to be to do it. And there was a huge time limit. And there was a lot of things going on. And, and they were like, well, show us a project where you've done something innovative. And when we showed them this little 50,000 square foot building in the meatpacking district, I think they, they were like, you did what? <laughs> you, you guys like made the facade? And, and that was how we landed the billion dollar project, you know, because of the risks we took on the little project, proved to them we could do the project that was 20X in, in scale. And, um, and so that's what I've been trying to sort of say is like, it's like, it's not, taking those new positions or launching new companies or it's not about making money. It's about expanding territory. And that's the key thing. It's about expanding opportunity. It's about, well, if we can make a software that does this, because this is a problem we're facing all the time, does that then get us involved in project A, B, C, and D? Because we have a thing that can help solve it, right? Hmm. If we can take a risk on something to try a new technology at this scale, does that get us invited to the party at this scale, right? And, and so that I think is, I think that was the real driver for us behind taking these kinds of risks. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't about financial reward. Mm. It was about territorial reward. It was about experimentation reward. It was about decision-making reward. It was about expanding all those opportunities. Would, would you say then that, because then it's like intention, right? As a key word in this part, like you're being very intentional about the risks you're taking. Like you're not the, it, and it's additive, right? Because you have a vision about where the company wants to go. Um, do you, you know, when you're, especially when you're describing like how it can open up new opportunities and things where it seems like you already have a vision about what that is. Um, how how concrete is that vision for shop like is it was it always from the very beginning like we want to do the kind of large projects that you're doing now which are kind of like almost the master plan level i think uh, they're, they're they're pretty massive uh, at points was that always kind of like the trajectory or 
Yeah, I think so. I think we did. We were super interested in that. I mean, honestly, you know, I, I think one of the, you know, as, as well as being a generalist profession, I think that we were also very interested in shop being a generalist architect. Like we did not want to be museum architects or university building architects or skyscraper architects or sports arena architects or master planner architects. Like we wanted all, all of the above, like, and we wanted to keep it fresh and interesting. But um, yeah, I think from the very beginning, we thought of like, you know, let's solve problems. And if it's a, if it's a problem, if it's a problem in a tiny little park in Greenport or two miles of waterfront in Manhattan, or, you know, uh, uh, some giant, some giant master plan, and in, in Asia or Australia or the West Coast, like it's just solving problems. And that was what we were interested in doing. As you've been like partnering with, you know, outside of your actual partner group, but like partnering with clients or on the client side, partnering on the means and method sides, like on fabrication, manufacturing, um, those individuals that you partner with, those other business partners, uh, what kind of lessons have you learned in terms of how they approach these very ambitious projects and how they build their own teams to uh, support those projects? Mm, that's a really good question. Um, you know, we I think we learned something on every single project. And, um, you know, maybe as we've gotten older, we were like, oh, wow, those were really risky things we did. But but that's OK. We try to keep it. We try to keep it going and we try to get smarter each each year. But, um, you know, I think that I think that people are kind of excited. People get excited because it's like, you know, they're kind of like, wait, you'll, you'll do what with us? Like, you'll try and solve our you'll try and help us. And then like they're like, well, here's how we can help you. And like people, you know, like we try to build these some of these buildings that are really pushed form and material and everything. And. And then we like make an extra drawing that shows the guy how to get his hand back there and make us custom make a certain wrench because we know it'll fit. And, and they're like, you thought about us? Like, dude, I'm gonna like, I'm gonna make the best building possible. Like it's, so there's a, I think it's just respect and empathy and thinking about the layers of what we do, not just making the images of buildings and saying, here, go, go build this you know, go, go figure it out for me. I mean, like we might not be right all the time in the things we love, but we're like, Hey, we think you could build it this way. And they're kind of like, yeah, we wouldn't do that, but we really appreciate that you tried <laughs> there. And then they try really hard to, to figure it out. You know what I mean? As opposed to you hand them some kind of shape and go like, yeah, figure this out. And so anyway, that's, I think that's, that's the ethos of where a lot of that comes from. You think by by doing that, um, the, I, I internally at monograph we sometimes talk about this idea of like, you know, how how can you do like these overlaps, right, and these handoffs? Um, basically, how can you do a little bit extra for someone else so that they can kind of have more context to be able to take it further faster? Do you find that those things? And you mentioned that sometimes it doesn't work. The intention is good, but it doesn't really. It's not realistic, right? But do you have you found? any patterns in that were like, well, actually it might make sense to have people that come from that world more embedded within shop so that that handoff is even cleaner because if when it is, when it is successful, the impact downstream of that is so much more, you know, value for the firm. Yeah. So the, yeah, so yes. The answer is yes. So we, we do bring in more and more people with different experiences and, and that's really good. The, the downside of that is um, you don't want to have so many people that are so entrenched in the way it's always done that they just say, oh, well, you can't do that. Like the thing that makes my head explode is when you come up with an idea and you present it in a meeting and they're like, well, you can't do that. And you're like, okay, why? And they're like, and if they say like, because that's not the way we do it. Like, I just literally go like, I literally cross that person off of you know, any like just okay. Why why wake up in the morning then? So um, uh, you know, and they may be right. I'm not saying that they're not always right, but it's like, can we try to solve it? Can we think about it in a different way? Like, can we push the limits of stuff? And you know, the funny thing is, is even when we've had people who have said you can't do it, and then like 
after three, four, five, six months, they're like, you know, that idea you talked about six months ago, you know, there's something there. And I'm like, yeah, thank you. But, you know, or sometimes they're like, yeah, that would have been a disaster. And I'm like, yeah, it would have been, but we tried and we try to figure it out and we learned something else about things. So, so it's that balance of expertise, but also, um, also being open, right? Like having that, having that real strong drive to challenge status quo. I think when you do important. what? Yeah. When you, when you do, and like, because some of these risks you've taken um, that many years have played out beyond them. So you've been able to see some performance. Um, curious where have been, if you could, if you'd be comfortable sharing, like, where has there been a risk that you've taken on that's really amplified a, a loss? And then also one that's like really amplified a gain. Like you gave this example of the Porter House and then scaling that opportunity up to Barclays. Um, I'm curious if there are any others where like the outcome was severely amplified because of the new level of risk that you took on. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I think the Porter House to Bar, you know, it, it, it's a direct thing like like. PS1 to Porterhouse to Barclays is like a total throughput. And now, you know, is, is stuff that we're doing, like those ideas are on every project now. And so, you know, that's just exponentially grown. Um, you know, I think that, I think that means and methods and construction have been a challenge because we always see that that's like kind of the, that's sort of where, where you hit the greatest, uh, um, roadblocks. And so, um, you know, I think, uh, I don't even know how long ago it was, but, you know, we, we tried shop construction, which was, you know, we were do doing, we were doing all of this work, you know, with, with digital modeling. And I mean, like we were kind of doing BIM before BIM was a thing. Like we were just doing it by hand. Like we were just modeling every part. And, and, and so I think that in, or as a younger firm, we were trying we were trying to get these buildings built and no one, the, con the construction industry didn't want to do it. So we would have to do a whole bunch of extra work and all these other kinds of drawings of, you know, exploded axons and fabrication tickets and all this stuff. And it was really hard to get paid for it because the clients were kind of like, well, you designed this crazy thing that no one can seem to build or no one wants to build. So like, if you want to make extra drawings to convince them to build it, like go ahead, right? And, and that was fine, you know, but like, you can't do that forever. So, I mean, I think that was the impetus for shop construction, which would say like, let's take the really complicated part of the building and can we, can we just make it? Can we just build it? And at, in the long run, it didn't work out, you know, and we, it, it was, it was, it was pretty tough. And, you know, it was, anyway, there are a lot of reasons, you know, then we got to B2, which was the tallest modular building, you know, in the country still is next to Barclays. And we were like, look, we got to move, we got to move from, we've got to move from standard construction practice. And we've got, you know, we were really excited about B2 because, you know, Bruce Ratner at Forest City knew he had 6 million square feet of housing to build and he was enough to build a factory in the, in the Navy Yard and start this company and build the whole thing. So we were really excited about it. And then, unfortunately, for a lot of reasons, you know, it ended up not being manufacturing. It ended up being like they just moved traditional construction inside. And this was no fault of Forest Cities. And, um, uh, and, and so it didn't work and it became a battle and it was frustrating and it was like, you know, but we knew that the, we knew that the the core of that was the way to go, right? Um, you know, although Katera, it was exactly the same thing. They just they try to do vertical integration and they moved they moved conventional construction indoors and spent a billion dollars doing it. We were like, that's not what we got to do. We got to get out of construction and we got to get into manufacturing, right? Two totally different mindsets. And so, you know, those were like. While B2 got built and eventually, but it took longer than it should have. And I think it hurt the reputation of high rise modular because of that. But, you know, there's a throughput. If, if Porterhouse, if, 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 if PS1 to Porterhouse to Barclays to the, you know, 10 projects behind me is a throughput of success, that was a throughput of, of not failure, but, but really hard stuff, right? 
But now we've got a we've spun off a new company called Assembly, which is doing offsite manufacturing. And it's like 20 years of those lessons are the DNA of this firm. And it's like super exciting what's going on there. So so I guess what I'm trying to say, I mean, there's a lot of detail I know, but like even in the failures that you you can turn that in, you can leverage that into something positive, right? And and so you know, I'd I'd rather I'd rather try, which all of us a chop, we'd rather try and fail and learn something than just do business as usual and move on to the next one. I hope that answered the question. No, it does. And I, I really appreciate the detail. Um, I'm curious now, like you've got these lessons learned and you and like with assembly and your crazy projects that you're working on now. Um, what like what is your thinking now about risk? Uh, and how, what lessons have you learned in terms of how to mitigate it? Uh, we've, we've even got, got a question in the chat that maybe we'll return to a little bit later about it too, about how to, um, what have you learned about mitigating that risk, like taking it on, but what are the details of that, that you make sure that you don't get too far into it, that you risk ruin uh, if something goes wrong? Yeah. Well, look, I mean, the, the, the dirty truth of it, quite frankly, is when stuff goes wrong, they sue everybody anyway. So the way that we mitigate risk is I'd rather have my hands in more places because I'd rather it be our fault than someone else's. And quite frankly, we like will try so hard to solve the problem that people don't it's people don't really sue us for that. Like, you know, that's not the thing. So it's like, I don't think you can ever really mitigate risk. So you may as well take on the responsibility and just do a good job. That's how you mitigate risk. Take it on, solve it, make your client happy, make the building hopefully performs and move on. And, you know, I, I always say like, I was like, you know, someone might say like, Oh my God, we built this building and there were these three issues. And I'm like, do you know how many decisions we made to build that building? 10,000. So you're telling me I got 9,997 right and three wrong. You're welcome. And by the way, I'll spend the next year fixing those three, but don't complain. <laughs> right? So, like, so the point is, take it on, just take it on, man. Like take it on and solve it and be a good guy and be a good, be a good person, have empathy, work your ass off and solve their problems as much as you can. And the clients will be happy and you get to do more. That's how we mitigate risk. I, I love that framing too, about this, like, it's almost like a game theory thing, right? It's like, if, if, if the, if the outcome will be negative at any, at any rates, right. The only way to, uh, to actually, um, mitigated is through this uh, taking more ownership of it, right? So at the end of the day, you either have, you're not susceptible to other people fucking up along the way. It's just all about you, right? And then there's a lesson to be learned there, which could be improved, but at least like, it's not like, hey, I just got sued because another partner out of like, you know, the the risk is just very different, right? Um, And look, there's stuff we can't do. Like I can't, I can't design a switch gear for a giant mechanical system on a, you know, on an infrastructure project, you know? And so like there's, but, you know, you, you try, you try your best to solve every problem that, that comes. And th- I mean, that's all you can do. Right. What would you say is um, the biggest challenges right now for shop as a company? Like, what do you, what's, what's very top of mind to you? What keeps you up at night? Well, you know, it's funny, you go through phases, like, you know, I I always, I do like to say, like, one of the great things about being an architect is you're young until you're 50. And then like, and then you're like, prime years are like 55 to 73. It like, like, you know, it's like, so it's kind of good, because there's always like, there's always positive stuff ahead, right? (laughs) Like, it's not better than being in the MBA, where you're like, washed up at 28. (laughs) So, um, um, you know, like we're kind of, you know, we're, we're the founding partners are like in our mid fifties, like, you know, we have, you know, it's like, it's like the first 10 years were the, were the, the little growing experimental firm. The second 10 years we turned, you know, we started building the big projects. We started winning, we started building the infrastructure of the office. We, 
we grew, you know, to 150 or 200 person firm. And now it's like, now we have 20 major projects around the world that are under construction or just finishing or, you know, whatever. And it's like this next big body of work is being released out to the world to see. Um, and so I think the next, the thing is like, what, what is next? Like, what, what do we do next? And, um, you know, I'd be happy to design beautiful buildings for the next 20 or 30 years. Um, uh, and that'll be great. But, uh, but I think there's more to it. Um, so I think assembly is super interesting. I think, um, <laughs> I think some of these large scale projects and watching, watching how they unfold, like, you know, it's like, it's like your children, these buildings are your children and you're releasing them out into the public and you want to watch how they behave and what they do and what they contribute and, and learn from that, um, is kind of a, is a kind of really interesting part. Um, but yeah, I mean, like that's, that's it. It's like, it's like, Okay, you know, like, how do I say this? Like, so much of getting the project, it's it's like always smoke. It's a, always has to be a little smoke and mirrors, right? Like, you can't get a thirty-story building until you've done a thirty-story building. You can't get a museum until you've done a museum. You can't get a university building or an embassy until you've done one. Well, how do you do one, right? Like, so there's always this like, it's always this battle of this crawling you know, grabbing the toehold and fighting your way up the, the, the rock cliff. Like now we've kind of like almost done like one or two of like a lot of project types. And so, you know, like, I don't know what it means to be really qualified. Like I've never, we've never really been in that <laughs> position. We were always the new kids on the block fighting and scratching and clawing and to get there. So now like, you know, now we're God forbid established and have a huge track record and it's like all right so what's gonna make what's gonna fire us up in the morning to to keep it going but so far we're still really happy walking in here every day that's awesome uh i'd love to do like a quick lightning round um from questions from the community so these are these are questions that have been upvoted uh and sourced from the community okay. um so first question is what do you geek out on Oh, hasn't this whole thing been geeked out, <laughs> geeking out on all this stuff? Um, we geek out on, we geek out on um, materials, you know, like really like looking at, I mean, I think like we super geek out on like, how do you take some of these materials that people haven't looked at in a while? Like, you know, eight years ago, nine years ago, 10 years, no one was looking at terracotta. And like, you know, we really thought about like, how do we take all this CN? And see technology and take something like that hasn't really been used in like 80 years and bring those together right and and 111 west 57th street being that prime example and i don't know how many of you guys are in new york but if you go by it it's pretty it's pretty remarkable building and um you know or american copper has been amazing or like the way we didn't use materials at barclays or or um, the way we're milling stone on some of the embassies that we're working on, some of it's just super remarkable and really fun. So I think we're super geeky on materials right now. What's your typical work week? Oh, for God's sakes, uh, pre or post pandemic. <laughs> pre, pre pandemic, it was, uh, you know, in the office, 930, meeting with all the teams all day, pinups, uh, you know, pinups, phone calls, design, and then, you know, like rolling out of here around seven and then like, and then there'd be two events a night, two night events. So like drinks with people or taking out staff or meeting a client or going to an opening or going to, a, you know, visit an, an artist studio or a gallery and then like a late night thing, which would be like a dinner at like 9, 10, which could also be with like clients or friends or other architects or artists or this like, and so it, it was, it, so it ended end up being like a 9.30 to 11.30, four days a week. That would be Monday through Thursday, Friday, try to wrap it up a little early and then read and look and think and recharge the batteries over the weekend. Never go out. We never go out on Friday or Saturday night, go out Monday through Thursday. What's your advice to your younger self? Well, my 
nice to my younger self, which would be like, chill out a little bit, would probably have destroyed my career. So nothing, just freak out, work hard, don't fuck up. <laughs> well, what is a mistake that you can't forget and what'd you learn? Oh, man. You know, it's so funny. It's like we, we, we were doing things we were doing things and we like, didn't talk about them because we thought it was like, so simple. Like we were like, well, that's not that interesting. And then we saw other architects take those ideas and make entire careers out of them. And it was like, we should have just opened our mouths or written a book and claim that territory. And then we were like, wait, they're basing their whole practice on that. Like we kind of did that on Tuesday and like forgot about it, you know? So it's like, it's, I guess my point is like, if you have ideas, like get them out there as much as you can and just, you know, I don't want to sound like a Nike ad, but just do it. So there were times we were timid where we shouldn't have been. So here's a question, a uh, Q&A question. I'd like to know if shop has an anticipated occupancy for one uh, eleven fifty seventh Avenue once the condos are sold. In other words, uh, for that building, how many of the units will be their primary residence as opposed to an investment property? I, I don't know. I mean, I don't, I don't know what the, I don't know, you know, that's, that's not part of what we do, but um, uh, what I have been told is it hasn't been a lot of foreign buyers. It's been mostly Americans. Um, uh, and I've been told that um, the, uh, I've been told that the, the, the new, the New Yorkers tend to buy the apartments lower in the building and the, the West Coast people have been buying it in the middle of the building and the Midwest people have been buying it in towards the top of the building. I don't even know what that means, but that's just what happened. I think the New Yorkers want to know, I think the New Yorkers know they have to look down on the street to know what the weather is, right? <laughs> that's good. Um, yeah, I, I think this is an interesting question about like how, you know, how involved is the architect in general into the, the mechanics of a real estate company and the developer like that information you know there's it's almost like never downstream right it never goes back to the architect because it's not it's not material to the contract even right no it's not i mean you know look we ask when we when we work on a building like that i mean just like when you work on an embassy or a university building or a museum you're thinking about like who's going to use it i mean like that's the most important thing and you know, I never, we never think of a building as like a solitary object. It, it's also dropped into its environment and it, and I always feel like the building radiates out into its environment and its environment radiates back in. And it's that, it's that pressure interchange that the architecture um, negotiates, let's say. So we do think about who's going to be there very, very deeply, but, you know, um, you know, on a develop on a developer building, you know, you could think who you think might be there, but it may not be the case. Sometimes it's surprising. Um, I do like to go. I do like to go to the buildings and just watch people using them. My my favorite my maybe you know what, my favorite moment as an architect is like when the buildings are kind of done and out there is like turning my back to the building and watching people look at the building. You know, and like when you see people gather their friends and they're taking the picture in front of the building or you see people look at it and they like they're in wonder and they're smiling or or yelling and saying they hate it. Like, I find that super fascinating, like just to just to watch it engage the public and become a part of the city. How does shop handle tools and software training uh, at the firm uh, and how does digital tools influence how the company hires? Uh, hugely. I mean, we're, you know, we, we hire a, va a variety of people. I, I think that we love, we love people who have multiple skill sets. Like, I, like we've always made the argument that you need expertise in at least two things to have a creative idea. Cause it's the, it's the spark between two levels of expertise that true creativity happens. And so like, you know, we love someone who is like, a poet undergrad and a coder grad <laughs> or like, you know, or a construction worker becoming a finance person or a sculptor who does mechanical systems. Like I, like, I, I think like those, that's super interesting. Um, and so obviously people with strong digital skills and ability to, to write software to code, are, like we love that, but like you also have, 
have to like have a good eye and a good hand and 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 a great aesthetic and and an ability to communicate and um and be good at be have empathy for those people who don't, maybe don't have a strong technical skills and share them you know and so that's there's i mean yes we have we have shop you we call it which is an internal um i mean obviously during covid it, it got put on hold but for years we had it so we have like trimesters and then shop staff pitch pitch to leadership like i want to teach this class and we and there's always at least three classes going on and then staff take the classes and it could be a wide variety. I mean, oftentimes there's a lot of technical stuff that goes on there, but it's also been like um, we had we had a person who um, was a manager of a bar for eight years before she went into architecture. And so she would teach mixology classes. And, you know, um, we have people who teach anything that they're interested in that are that are related to architecture or not related to architecture. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean that's where that's where a lot of it that's where a lot of it comes from. And then also, um, you know, people have ideas. Like they come in. It's almost like applying for a grant. They come to leadership and say, like, "Hey, I want to write this software, and I need like six weeks to work on it. Can I can I take that time? And will you let us do it? And then we'll develop something. And I think this tool is valuable for this. And and if they we make them make a pitch to us and almost write a pro forma to us. And then we'll we'll green light it and 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 see what they do. So um, that's that's the way a lot of stuff has been developed in the office. I almost feel like that that one like learning how to construct a business case. That alone, in some in some way, is the unexplored opportunity for the for at least architecture education, because oftentimes, even when you're working within a firm. A lot of times, I think this, this obviously leadership matters, and being open, leadership has to be open to receive new ideas from their employees. And it's likely that your firm won't go very far if you're not you don't have that mindset to begin with. Um, but that idea of being able to articulate, you know, you see a problem in a workflow inside of the office, like, and you feel like you have a vision for what the solution might be. Either you can go out and do it because of the sort of your the it's a reversible decision in some way, right? You should just go out and, 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 and take initiative. Or if it does require more investment and more rallying alignment, it's like putting a business, a simple like deck that just shows like, this is the challenge. Here's the opportunity of like what the new workflow would look like. And by the way, here's a schedule for yep. like how to get it done, right? I mean, that, that alone is like a simple framework just taught to every student would probably like advance careers internally in some firms like uh, tenfold. Um, okay, so uh, there is... Um, one uh, additional question here, and this is from Marjan. She's a great uh, interview interviewer herself. When it comes to the value, like how shop expresses its value, does the shop look to express its value also through the way that it structures fees? Like, is that something critical to the way that the firm operates too from a business perspective? And have you figured out, have you made some sense of that, right? Because this is a big topic even within the industry about like everyone's talking about, oh, we should be charging on value, 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 right? Yeah, it's, it's a, I mean, look, it's the, it's a hard thing. I mean, you know, I, I always say like, it's the most ridiculous thing that we charge by the hour, right? Like, you know, I mean, there are some hours where one of us comes up with an amazing idea that that hour was worth a million dollars. And there were a lot of other hours that were worth like six cents. So, um, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of, it's kind of crazy, you know, unfortunately it's really hard, right? Cause you've got this industry standards and, you know, it's what, it's what lenders will accept. And, you know, it's like, it's always, it's always a bit of a battle. And so, you know, a lot of the stuff that I'm talking about costs more, right? A lot of these things cost more, but like to us, that's our reinvestment in the firm, right? Like, so, you know, if you, if one could, I'm, and I'm making numbers up, but let's just say, you know, you think you could get a 15% profit margin and it's like, well, but I'm only going to get a seven and a half percent profit margin on this one. Well, that seven and a half percent was my, was my reinvestment in the firm to build the territory, to create the tools that I can do more in the future. So like, you know, we've, we've really kind of reinvested everything the firm has made back into the firm for for 20 years and that's how we grew it right but yeah it's it's hard to like actually i mean i guess the point is like 
do I actually get, do, it's hard to get like more fee, but maybe you get more and better projects because you can do things that other people can't. Right, it scales uh, up at some point, right? It's like you're able to take on that next project because of that, yeah, which yeah. is much larger. It, it, it's like, it's not even about a margin issue. It's almost like it's the aggregate amount that's not talked about, right? It's actually like that seven, like seven, you know, 10% of like a hundred is very different from 10% from like whatever, right? Right, uh, like much right. Yeah. exactly, exactly. And so, you know, um, I think that goes back to my, what I was trying to say before about territory. It's about, it's about growth and territory and growth and opportunity, right? And, um, you know, it's not, it's not about the bottom line dollars and cents, you know? I mean, like we want to make enough money that we can have a, that everyone, you know, has a nice salary and good benefits and, and doesn't have to worry about their family. And we have a nice environment to work in and like, you know, and we can be there and be supportive and we can try things and experiment and all that stuff. Um, but, you know, it's, it's really about, it's really about expanding opportunities and places that you can think and, and risks that you can take and things you can try and keeping it, keeping it really exciting to go into work every day. All right, we're gonna last. What we're gonna end with my last question, uh, go to one. Um, uh oh, I'm nervous. I'm nervous. <laughs> no, it's, it's not bad. Um, it, you know, feel free to get emotional. So, it, what is the nicest thing anyone's ever done for you? Oh man, they can be personal. It can be, you know, we've we've had all sorts of answers, which is really core to like. It's really special to this interview. Uh, you know, um, I think the nicest thing. I think the nicest thing that anyone's ever done for us is, you know, we, we, we came into it and like, and this happens a lot, but like we've, like I said, I think I was saying this before, like we broke things, we came in, we didn't do it the normal channels. We, you know, whatever. And like, honestly, like we're, we're like fairly myopic sometimes, like we're working so hard and our heads are down so much. Like we have no idea. We still think we're like this little firm, like we really do. And, um, the nicest thing that I think the nicest thing is that when I'm traveling around the world and I'm especially like at universities or I'm at conferences or whatever, and like people just come up and just sort of say like, Hey, I saw this building or I heard your lecture or I did this. And like, I want you to know it, like it really meant something to me. And just like knowing, just knowing that anything that we're doing out there that people are watching and it's helping people and we're expanding it. And like that tiny little bit of encouragement that might seem silly, like, it's really valuable because like, you know, this is hard. <laughs> this is all hard. And like, you know, so to know, to know that, to know that there are people out there and, and they could be, they could be former students or colleagues or competitors or whatever, or, or mentors or mentees, whatever it might be. But just like, just to hear that, like, it's making a difference means, means the whole world to makes us want to keep going. So I, I, it's, it's a lot of people, but it's, it's those kind moments that, that mean something to us. Well, thanks a lot, Greg. That was awesome. Great closing. There are a lot of people in the room and, and a lot of people who will be listening in the future you, using the insights that you've shared with us today to help them work through challenges in their career and in their firm. So I really appreciate it. And thank you very much, George. It was a great conversation. Oh, thank you so much, uh, Chris and George. It was it was really fun to do, and uh, hopefully we'll get to do something in person soon, one of these days. So, best of luck and and stay in touch. Okay, guys. Yeah, I'll see you soon. Thanks. Bye, Have everybody. Bye, thank guys. You, everyone. Cheers.